Good morning, Sunnyside family and friends. Before we start our worship and sounds of organ would prepare our minds and hearts um, for that experience, I want to welcome all of you here in this sanctuary and all of those who joined us online. Special welcome to the Walla Walla nursing students. I have special emotional attachment to your group because my daughter is a freshman at Walla Walla and I know that in a few years she'll be here sitting like you on those pews. So I'm looking forward to that time. Um, before we start, I just want to let you know about, um, you know, if you want to stay connected with what's going on here at Sunnyside, you're welcome to check our bulletins as well as the communique. You can grab a hard copy or you can subscribe and receive that information every Friday so you would know what's happening, not only at Sunnyside Church, but in the area around. For now, I just want to tell you that today at 5, we're going to have another Adventure Club meeting that um, is going through um, you know, adventures around the world. And tonight, it's going to be South Africa with Pastor Shirley and another very cool people to um, introduce your kids to that um, part of the world. So at 5 p.m., 6.30, we're having even song. So if you're craving that special, solemn, sacred experience and want to hear beautiful word and organ music, we invite you to come here at 6.30 and enjoy that. And probably we've heard that one of our dear friends, Lane B, passed away suddenly and we're going to have memorial for him tomorrow at 11. So if you would want to attend and honor his life and memory, please come. Um, our prayer is that God would bless us as we worship him together. Blessings.
Welcome to Sunnyside. I've been attending this church pretty much my entire life, and I don't think I've ever led in song service, so this is exciting. <laughs> so um, please join us in singing our hymn of gathering. It's hymn number 10, Come Christians, Join to Sing. And we'll sing all three verses. have a grandson. Thank you, Troy. <laughs> <laughs> Your call to worship this morning is being read from my NIV Bible, Ephesians 2, 4, and 5, and 8. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And again in verse 8, it says, For, grace, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that is, that is not from ourselves, it is the gift of God. Have you ever stopped to think about what grace really is to you? To me, it is undeserved blessings that God gives us because of his everlasting, unfailing love. Our hymn of praise will be number 109, Marvelous Grace, and we will once again sing all three verses. Please stand.
its beautiful song. Let us ask God's blessing, and for this we will kneel before God. Almighty and everlasting God, as we gather in this Sabbath morning in your presence today, we come before you with humble hearts seeking your mercy and grace. We lift our prayers for those among us who are sick and in need of healing. May your comforting presence surround them strengthening and restoring their bodies and souls. We also lift our citizens and residents, especially the youth, children, and parents who face challenges and uncertainties in these difficult times. Grant, grant them your wisdom and protection, guiding them toward righteousness and peace. Lord, we pray you to mediate in the conflict, plugging our world, bring an end to the war in Europe. We pray to extend your hand of protection over Ukraine. May your peace reign amid turmoil, sparing as many lives as possible from violence and destruction. We also ask for your divine intervention in the Middle East, particularly in the Holy Land. Bring an end to the strife and discord that disrupt the lives of your people. Let your justice and righteousness prevail, uniting hearts and minds to pursue harmony and reconciliation. As we gather for the Sabbath service today, we ask for your blessings to be pure upon us. Illuminate the uh, preacher's words so that they may be a source of inspiration and enlightenment to all who hear. Bless every member of this congregation and every visitor with your grace and peace. May this time of worship be a testament of your glory and an example of hope in a world filled with darkness. In your holy and precious name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we lift our prayers this morning. Amen. I hope we all enjoy April months, the blooming, the flowers, the what we have around, the, the birds, and also this beautiful Sabbath which we have today. And I wanted to express a few, few words in different languages there. Uh, I have a request today to say, okay, we already know the happy Sabbath, this is what we understand. Although in uh, Spanish, you can excuse me if I wrong pronunciation of this word, but it's Feliz Sabbath. The interesting, the word Sabbath is pretty much understandable. And uh, in uh, Russian language, Shasliva Suboty, Ukrainian is Harnoy uh, Suboty, and Romanian is Sabbath Pharisee, if I right. All right, thank you. At today's offering, we have a schedule for Hope Channel. A few words about the um, Hope Channel, the history. Hope Channel International Incorporation leads the global Hope Channel network that is focused on reaching unreached people groups with the message of internal hope, utilizing various media formats and platforms. 
including television, streaming platforms, social media, and other, other digital platforms. Hope Channel began broadcasting in North America in 2003, and today Hope Channel is a global network with more than 80 channels broadcasting in more than 100 languages. God bless every of one who is sitting in this sanctuary and participating in this offering. God bless you. It's time for the children's stories, so if you want to come and bring these little white cups for children's Adventist education. Sabbath children. I'm going to be talking about an event that happened in my life that really showed how much God cared about me. 
So in my senior year of high school, there was an event called Bible Camp, and it's basically where kids from my school and other schools can go to a place up in Washington where we can learn about God and we can go do fun activities. We can have fun together. There was go-karting, there's swimming, and then at the end of every night, we'd have a sermon and we'd get to listen to stories about God. Well, everyone in the school, most people were planning on going, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to go. I wasn't sure if I wanted to go there or to work instead because I wanted, I, I liked my job at the time. I wanted to work and I wasn't really sure if I wanted to go to this thing, but something kept telling me I should go to this thing. I should go to Bible camp. I should call out or I should schedule time off work and go to Bible camp. So while I was there, I was hanging out with this person named Onyx and Onyx and I didn't really get along. Like, do you kids, is there maybe a kid in your life you just don't get along with? Yeah, yeah, we did not get along. It, but it wasn't good because a lot of our friends, a lot of my friends were her friends. So we had to hang out. And it's not great to hang out with somebody you don't get along with, right? But do you know what the Bible says about getting along with people? God wants us to get along with everyone, right? Well, that trip showed me that even when you don't like somebody or they don't like you, you can find common ground. You can get to meet them. One day, I got nachos for lunch, and what do you do, and Onyx decided that she wanted one of my nachos, right? And what do you do when you want something that somebody else has? You ask, right? Like, can I have a nacho, that kind of thing. It's a polite thing to do. And she asked for a nacho, and I decided, yeah, I'll share my nachos, okay, yeah. Well, we hung out some more that day. We went swimming, we went go-karting, all that kind of fun stuff. And then later the next night, I got more nachos because they were so good. The nachos there are the best. And this time, I sat down, I went to find my friends, sat down at the table with them, and Onyx just took a nacho. And usually, I don't like it when people just take my food without asking, right? Like, my nachos, they were good. They're, you guys like nachos, right? Yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. You wouldn't want people to take your nachos. but. This time, it was okay. It was okay because it meant that she was comfortable enough with me to know that I would be fine with sharing my nachos. And that was when I realized that we were friends because she was fine with just taking my food and I was fine with letting her have some. Well, we got to know each other over that, the course of the rest of the Bible camp, and we're still really good friends to this day. We still hang out with each other on a daily basis, and well, weekly. Um, and it really showed me that Bible, the Holy Spirit, I think the Holy Spirit was encouraging me to go to Bible camp because I wanted to go to work, but instead I went to Bible camp. Do you think maybe he wanted me to be friends with Onyx? You think maybe he wanted me to make friends with a fellow believer that I wasn't getting along with? Because I think that's what happened. I think God wanted, us to, wanted me to go to Bible camp so that I could make friends with somebody that I wasn't getting along with so that we could still be friends to this day. All right, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for friends and thank you that we can get along with people even after some problems with people. Thank you that you encourage us to do things because you want what's best for us and you want what's best for others. Please help us to listen to you when you talk to us and please help us to show mercy and politeness and love to people even if we don't get along because maybe we will get along and maybe we'll become best of friends. Amen. All right, you can go back to your seats.
to the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Our scripture today is Revelation 2, verses 1 through 4, and I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. Write this letter to the leader of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know all things that you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles, but you are not, but you have discovered that they are not and that they're liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you first did. Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. It's good to see all of you, regulars, visitors, and those of you joining via live stream. Before we get into the message, I believe we have some business to take care of. Who remembers the little preview teaser I gave at the end of last week's service? Anybody? A few of you, hands go right up. I promised that I was going to make a big announcement, right? You ready for this big announcement? On Monday, I'm going to Australia. Isn't that nice? <laughs> That's not what you were waiting for. I'm just kidding. But I would appreciate prayers as I make that trip to speak for camp meeting. However, the big announcement I have is somewhat related to Australia. I need to walk you back a little bit, a couple months, uh, to the month of January, where, as many of you might remember, we began to hear some things uh, from Oregon Conference, which is the governing uh, body of the Adventist churches in Oregon, that there were some financial challenges happening. And as those messages are being delivered, uh, reading between the lines, realizing, as, as you do now, of course, because there has been some video announcements and public announcements, that there's going to be some staffing reductions and there's going to be some changes happening. And immediately where my mind went is thinking that we, as a church, are probably going to lose our fourth pastoral position traditionally uh, for children and families. Now, when we talk about crises, uh, one thing that crisis literature likes to bring out is the Chinese character for crises. There's two, there's two it's a compound word, right? Compound uh, symbol. One of it means crisis. There's definitely a crisis, some financial challenges, and the other is opportunity. So I began to pray and talking with the team said, is there a way that we can lean into this moment of crisis and upheaval, maybe lean in and to start to strategize and say, how can we as a pastoral team and a church offer some help in this time of staff reduction and change without overextending ourselves? How can we extend our ministry as pastors without overextending ourselves or, or removing any of the ministry that this congregation expects from their pastoral team? And so we began to strategize and meet and strategize. And I can't tell you how many pages of digital paper I scrolled and wrote and charted. And I started to have meetings 
meetings with administration, then I had meetings with the team, then administration, and then I prayed, and then more meetings and conversations and praying, and we decided to pitch a strategy, strategy to say, is there any way we could keep a fourth position and, and lean into this moment and be a blessing to our Oregon Conference family? So we made a proposal and prayed and waited and waited and waited <laughs> for it was probably only like two and a half months, but it felt like year. I'm a very impatient person, so I just, nothing to do but wait. And about a week and a half ago, it became official that they approved the plan, and on May uh, 11, we are going to welcome Pastor Rose Andrew Canis to our pastoral team. We are very excited for her to come. She's coming from Meadowglade, and the way this works is because of an in-conference transfer and some of the things we worked out, it doesn't add anything to the bottom line of the conference. Uh, for those of you who have friends at Meadowglade and pastoral friends, we have pastoral friends too. There's a good spirit between our churches, but I hope you will join me in welcoming Pastor Rose when she comes on staff on May 11 for her first Sabbath. Can I get an amen? amen. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, um, it's been a long process, but we are excited for our children's ministry. Um, she has a wonderful background. She is from Australia. I believe we've had an Australian pastor in this congregation before. Isn't that right? She's from Australia. Her uh, undergraduate work initially was environmental science, so she's very outdoorsy before she studied for the ministry. She is well-traveled. She has worked for ADRA. She has been the conference in Australia Youth and Young Adult Director, which means she has worked from everyone from ages 4 to 40, and we are excited that she is joining our pastoral staff. And of course, there'll be more to share in the future, um, but just continue to pray uh, for our Oregon Conference, pray for Pastor Rose, pray for Sunnyside as we prepare to welcome her on staff and get back to planning some excellent ministry opportunities for our congregation here at Sunnyside. Now, time to get to the message. If you remember, I shared last week, I'm going to tell you a story about the worst church member I ever had. But before I did do that, we need to bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for the chance to come together and worship. And all of us bring so many different experiences and backgrounds to the worship experience to church. And I pray that you can help us put aside those things that may cause us stress or anxiety, trauma, and to have a moment of Sabbath peace and rest. Help us to hear your voice. Help us to... Sense your presence in a fresh way. And as we discuss this important issue in a world that is full of contention and angst, help us to remember to be loving in our communication and in our attitudes and to not fall into the Ephesus effect. In your precious name we pray, and everyone said, Amen. It was shortly after, maybe a month after I began my ministry after graduating from Union College. First month in my first assignment as an intern pastor, there was no senior pastor at the church, when I seriously considered murdering one of my church members. <laughs> I first met Ted at the door at the end of my first sermon. As people were walking through and shaking hands, he approached me. Now, I had preached that Sabbath on the text that says, love your neighbor. And I took a very literal approach. I said, this week, why don't we all reach out and do something literally loving for our neighbor, right? You know, maybe we can mow their, their lawn, we can give them a gift. Let's do something for our neighbor. Pretty straightforward, loving Jesus kind of message. Ted came to me at the door, extended his hand warily. I grabbed it and shook it, and he said, I can see you're a proponent of the new theology. Now, I didn't understand at the time that that was code in that church culture for people who embraced heresy. Didn't understand the history behind that term, comes from sort of the 1950s, didn't understand any of the history. I had not been to seminary yet. So me being completely ignorant, I just leaned into it. Absolutely. I figured, I figured new meant fresh and cutting edge. That's right. The newest it could possibly be, sir. Thank you so much. Happy Sabbath. A few days later, I went down to the mailbox in our apartment, and I discovered a postcard. You can awe a little bit. This is a cute dog. Thank you. Right. Picked it up. Postcard. It's a duckling. Oh, that's nice. Who would have sent that to me? Is it my grandma? Is it maybe a church member? And it was a church member, and it was Ted. And I turned it over, 
you are a joke and a fool. You need to preach the word. You seek to glorify the self and you need to be humbled. You act like a Jesuit, by the way. For those of you who don't know, like the worst thing you, as a Protestant you could get called is a Jesuit, which is thought to be in sort of Protestant, you know, some history, some folklore, sort of like the Illuminati, right? It's like the secret society who are out to get everybody. You act like a Jesuit plant to lead the church astray. Repent, lest God punish you for your indiscretions. Proverbs 21, 6. And I always love how they, they all sign it the same way, right? Love your brother in Christ. Not Henry, should be, should be Ted. You know, um, uh, thanks, autocorrect. Um, love your brother in Christ, Ted. I was seating, you know. And of course, I picked up the Bible, so before I had a smartphone, and I turned to Proverbs 27, 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Now, this passage, in its context, is simply making the point that as good friends in a healthy relationship, we can hold each other accountable, right? We can have unpleasant conversations to encourage each other. Uh, but there's people out there who flatter us and don't tell us the truth. What he was doing was being spiritually and verbally abusive and then justifying it with an out-of-context or out of context text, right? And by the way, over the years, this is sort of a rite of passage to receive mail like this and emails like this and apparently postcards like this where, where people will use this passage and love you. They, they think what they're doing is loving, just, just tearing you a new one. Now, over the next several weeks, I would get one of these weekly, twice a week. All kinds of invectives, all kinds of insults, all kinds of personal attacks. And I was so angry. And I went and I shared them with my new, beautiful, beloved wife. And do you know what this woman did? She laughed. <laughs> she thought this was the funniest thing because they always came with like a baby duckling, a baby deer, these most beautiful, pleasant thing. And on the back was the most horrific, tear you a new one kind of a message. And she would say, just, you know, he's just an old man. He's going to be a dead old man if he keeps it up, right? I was so angry, you know. And she's like, you just need to, you just need to pray for him, you know, pray. So I did. I began to pray for Ted. And I even began to stand on some promises in the Bible. Promises, let's say, the days of our life are 70 years or perhaps 80. <laughs> if we are strong, even then their span is only toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Lord, by my calculations, Ted is 82. <laughs> and based on your word, <laughs> I feel like this man has missed his flight. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Swing low, sweet chariot. You need to send a ride for this man. Another verse I enjoyed is it appointed, it's appointed once for unto men to die. You know, this man has, has, has passed his expiration date. Milk's gone bad. Another good one. To everything there's a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. Fall is my favorite season. Whether it's leaves falling off the trees or if this man happened to fall, um, it could be fine. Weeks, months, back and forth. Me defensively arguing what I felt to be truth and Ted offensively attacking me what he thought to be truth and neither one of us getting closer to Jesus. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Revelation 2, 1 to 4. We encounter a church that is having some issues with how it tells the truth. It's at a place called Ephesus. John is in vision. And Jesus is, is sharing some messages for seven churches, churches in key areas, each with their own opportunities and challenges. Now, to give you some background on Ephesus, New Testament scholar N.T. Wright points out on one side they had some of the richest soil in Asia Minor and access to the Silk Road. On the other side, they had built a port to trade with the rest of ancient Europe. They built a city of marble. They built a stadium that sat tens of thousands of people. They built a two-story teaching hospital. They built a sprawling library. But most importantly, they built the Temple of Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the world. Ephesus was steeped in idol worship. The whole economy was built on idol worship. If you remember, we shared this a couple weeks ago when Paul was preaching in Ephesus and religious uh, vendors saw their, their customers being swept away by the way of Jesus. They rioted. They attacked. Imagine being in a place where the whole co economy is built on a particular religion that doesn't happen to be yours. You can imagine things got a little tense. There was pressure to participate in a belief system and an ideology that did not match with your belief system. 
And so they had to fight to hold on to truth. And we read in the Bible to the angel, the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance. I know that you cannot tolerate evildoers. You have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them to be false. I also know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for the sake of my name and you have not grown weary. This is a church that has to fight to keep a foothold, to have any sort of influence whatsoever. And I think some of us might be able to identify with this church. In a world of post-truth and deep fakes and propaganda and Christianity losing its social currency in many ways, and sometimes for good reason, it can feel like we're under attack. And when you're in that defensive place, you feel compelled to hold fast, to push back against the currents that are trying to take your faith away. And most people in this age, when truth is always followed by a question mark and people have trouble accessing truth, to be considered a community and a space known for being truthful is high praise. I mean, how many of us would love our church to get a letter from Jesus saying these words, I know how hard you work I know your faithfulness. I know your earnestness. I know how you can't stand evildoers. I know that you work so hard. Wouldn't you love a letter from Jesus like that? What an affirmation for your church. And yet I'm here to tell you that when you are in that defensive, polemical, apologetic space, it can go badly wrong for your soul. When you spend any length of time in the cauldron of apologetics, polemics, defensiveness, arguing, it can backfire. Ted and I were locked in a battle for truth for months. The bad news for Ted is I have a fairly decent gift of discernment, and I began to realize that there was more to his theological concerns than my performance in the pulpit. Just as an aside for interpersonal relationships, most of the time, many times when someone goes over the top criticizing you or has a visceral emotional reaction to something simple, it usually tells you it's not so much about you, that there's something more going on with them in the background. And as I began to sleuth without the aid of a senior pastor, but I had the office manager who knew the things, as well as elders, I began to discover some things about Ted. First of all, he had a practice of targeting the intern pastor, trying to become their mentor. He confirmed as much. I talked to him at church once, and he said, look, the la your predecessor, two predecessors ago, he, he listened to me. He listened to, he, he was humble, unlike you, and he listened to everything I said about his sermons, and you know what happened? He was 80% better. Couldn't be 100% because then there'd be nothing left to criticize. And as far as I knew, that's how Ted stayed alive, was just you know, he had to have something to criticize. More than that, I was told by the office manager that two senior pastors ago, he showed up unannounced, walked into the lead pastor's office and said, you are too fat to be a minister. He would hover in the wings during evangelistic outreach meetings to find visitors and guests to tell them how awful the church was. But none of that compared to what happened down with our community service ladies in the fellowship hall. We had a faithful group of senior citizens who would work in community outreach in the fellowship hall every Wednesday. And the word started to come out that Ted had gone down there, would go behind the older ladies and wrap his arms around them, hug them close and say, when are you going to leave your husband and come home with me? Found out Ted had been married four times and divorced. Churches had tried to discipline him, but he left his membership out of state so nobody could hold him accountable for the shenanigans he pulled inside the church, which also included around that time three or four small congregations having a coming out meeting of sorts with several ladies saying they had had indiscretions with this elderly gentleman. And to top it off, 
in the fall when I broke my jaw. I had a compound fractured jaw playing flag football. Don't ask. I mean, I can tell you it's gory, and I will tell you the gory details because I lived through it, and I want you to know. But I had to get wired shut for six weeks in a titanium plate. My poor wife, who had only been married you know, for three months, had to feed her husband through a syringe. I got a call in my office while I was wired shut, and it was Ted. And he said, that was God's way of shutting you up. Now, I want to pause here. I'm going to pause here for two reasons. Number one, those of you who judged me at the beginning of the sermon and now feel like maybe I need to repent, I judged him too hastily. Um, I accept apologies in the form of Starbucks gift cards, so just so you know. <laughs> Second of all, I want to assure you as a pastor that I would not allow somebody that verbally abusive to get traction in the country. It would not go that long it would be dealt with. I want to, you to know that your leadership team wants church to be a safe place from that kind of a spirit. And we would move very swiftly to remove that influence. However, I would not do what I did then. As he said those things over the phone, I cut him off. Through gritted teeth, I had to because I was wired shut. There was no other way to talk. <laughs> Through gritted teeth, and I listed every single sin that he committed in detail and followed up with, you are never welcome at church ever again. Do you understand me? Ever. There was a long pause, and he said, that's pretty clear, brother. And he hung up, and we never spoke to each other ever again. Now, It was absolutely okay and justified to set a boundary. Boundaries are a part of healthy relationships. But in that space, something happened under that sort of criticism and attack, which I believe happened at Ephesus. And we can read it in verse 4 in chapter 2. Jesus saying, But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. For all your truth-telling, there is no love in it. Scholars talk about both, that this refers to a loving relationship, personal relationship with Jesus, and loving each other in the community. The love is gone. In that defensive, critical space, truth was weaponized, and it's no longer meant to heal, it's meant to hurt. And there, is abs there was absolutely no redemption in my heart. It was gone. There was no love with the truth. And that action, that what I call the Ephesus effect, when you're under so much attack and scrutiny and defense, whatever critical spirit he had, I had adopted it too and probably had even less mercy and grace in my heart than he did at that moment, almost making me the worst church member. Illustrating another point that I heard, I can't remember where I heard this quote, but this, this quote haunts me. Christians sin the most when they're right. When we feel that righteous indignation, we are willing to justify just about everything. And Jesus indicates that there is more danger in that space than there is with error. If we keep reading the account... In the Bible, in verse 5, we read this. Remember then, and the tense in the original language means a continual remembering. Continue to remember then from what or where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, now catch this, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Catch this. Jesus would rather have no light than distorted light. Why? It is much easier to tell someone the truth who's never heard it than someone who has been hurt by the truth out of the mouth of an abuser. We have this idea that floats around the church that, that truth is sort of an abstract propositional thing to be believed 
that truth is a position, or worse, that truth is a possession. We have the truth. But it's more than that. The Bible says even the demons believe the truth has got to be so much more than that. Truth is the content of loving relationships. Truth comes from the character of God, which you know from Scripture is love and implies an other and a relationship. So if you strip the truth, the character of truth away, if you strip truth's character away, in a sense it becomes a lie. Truth without its character is a lie because it distorts the reality it claims to represent. And in that process, you can shut somebody's ability to hear the truth off. Everyone following so far? It's dangerous to be in that space. Jesus says, I would rather have no light than a distorted light. Truth without its character of love is a lie. It's an insidious one. Because whatever elements of accuracy may be contained in our expression, it's coded in a layer of criticism that shuts people off from hearing. In the case of Ephesus, their combative, defensive, polemical, apologetic nature had withered the love in their hearts, both for Jesus, each other, and their community. They could no longer see friends. All they saw was enemies. Truth was not there to heal relationships. It was there to hurt them. Truth was a weapon, not a means to the way of Jesus. And if we're not careful in those spaces, we begin to communicate with an attitude that removes the possibility of redemption away from the people we're talking to. Several years later, I called the senior pastor, my mentoring pastor, who arrived much later and would not kick Ted out of church like I wanted him to and wasn't as aggressive as me. But a few years later, I called him and I was chatting about ministry in church and I said, hey, is old, is old Ted still around? You know, and he said, yeah, he is. And he's like, that guy, you know, is he still causing trouble? No, he's actually gotten much softer and kinder. I'm like, that's almost upsetting. You know, um, how? How is that possible? You know, and he said, terminal cancer will do that to you. And he said, he came to my office, and I let him in. I wouldn't have. I let him in, and he sat down, and he talked about how this terminal illness had given him perspective on his life and the way he had conducted himself. And he wanted to make things right. And so he began attending church again. And eventually, when he did pass away, his kids did not want to have a funeral for him because of some of the actions he did. And my senior pastor was able to explain the change that had happened in his life because even though there had to be boundaries, there was still the possibility of redemption. There was still a, a heart's desire to see him turn it around. That desire was gone for me, but he had it. And as he shared that with Ted's kids, it softened their hearts, and they had a beautiful memorial service for him. And so, when we all get to heaven, the Bible says that every tear will be wiped away in heaven and the new earth. It does not say every awkward moment will be wiped away. <laughs> And I'm anticipating a very awkward moment, many awkward moments. I mean, can you imagine when we finally meet Adam? I have some things to say um, about our friend Adam, who, who in the garden, who messed things up for everybody. <laughs> but I believe in that space, Ted and I will be glad to see each other, even if it's a little awkward at first. In Ephesians, a letter written by Paul, the same space, same church, he reminds them, instead, speaking the truth in what? Love. We will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. Love implies a relationship of mutual regard and trust that often gets eclipsed by our need to be right and to present ourselves in the best light possible. One rule of thumb I like to remind myself of when I have to sh share difficult messages is to ask myself, 
how often do I speak kindness and positivity into this person's life? How, how many, if, to use a banking metaphor, have I made deposits in the emotional, relational account of this person before making a withdrawal? When I look at the ratio of communication between me and another person, me and another group, uh, and maybe you've been that way too as you're thinking about the different groups you communicate with, your spouse, your kids, your family, maybe children's ministries, youth ministries, senior ministries, whatever it is. What ratio is it? Or how much positivity do you invest first before you have to share a difficult truth? What I tell people is if you do that little inventory and you realize that the only time I ever talk to this person or these people is to criticize, it means you're not working for Jesus. You're working for the one whom the Scripture calls the accuser. We are entering, in this country likely, a very contentious election season. And everybody on all sides will admit that we are in a space when truth is under attack and our ability to access truth and express truth. And there is going to be a great temptation to say things in this world, again, of... of fake news and propaganda and deep fakes and out-of-context clips and, and everything else, and just the, the sheer glut of information we all have to process. There's going to be that temptation to, to dehumanize and demonize other people and to say things that are, that are unredemptive and not born of a redemptive spirit. So this week, I want us to practice speaking life and love into other people's lives. Take a moment to, to think through people who you're going to come in contact with and be intentional to share positive, uplifting messages to them. Build that habit this week. In Aristotle's rhetoric, and many of you have gone through public speaking in high school and college, or Walla Walla nursing students, I know I have to go through a public speaking course. Aristotle's rhetoric, he talks about there's the logos, which is the logic, that's the flow of our arguments. There's the pathos, that's our emotion, and there's the ethos, which is the perceived goodwill that people have from us. The most powerful persuasive tool you have is your ethos. The most powerful persuasive tool you have is if people perceive that you have their best interest at heart, they will listen to you. So practice investing in other people with your communication, positivity. We can never control how someone hears us. We all have traumas and personalities that affect how we hear things. But we can start practicing taking the initiative to create self-awareness, checking our motives, and responding to others with care. This week, let's begin investing in remembering the love we have for our Savior and for each other, and to speak truth in love so we can keep our light for Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for seeing us through difficult moments relationally, whether that's in our profession, in our families, school. Lord, in those moments of conflict which will come, they're unavoidable, help us to have opportunities to speak the truth in love, even when we have to set up boundaries, even when we have to begrudgingly admit that people, even people like Ted, had some kernels of truth to share that I was not ready to receive at that time. Help us to have an open heart and mind to listen and to not fall into the Ephesus effect when we're attacked and criticized to lash out. Give us a heart of love so we can keep our land stand lit for you and show your love with the world. In your name we pray, amen. So it's our turn to respond. And I'm so thankful I know how this story ends. Nothing better than looking on Jesus' face when we're up there in glory with him. Our song is the glory song, number 435, and we'll sing all three verses. Stand.
be seated. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today at Sunnyside. It's been so good to see all of you. Next week, we will be featuring PAES, Portland Adventist Elementary School. They're going to be having a service, and Vice Principal Elizabeth Frizzi will be uh, sharing the sermon. I uh, hope you will show up to support that. I uh, appreciate all the ministry that they do with our, our young ones. Uh, I'll be thinking of you, praying for you while I'm traveling. Hope you'll pray for me. Uh, please remain seated as we enjoy the postlude together. Thank you. 